What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and today we're gonna take a look at the six most common myths that have been perpetuated about coffee. So today, in order to help us work through these myths, I have brought Dr. Samo Smirke. He is a research associate at Zurich University of the Applied Sciences with a PhD in chemistry. Welcome to the show. Hi, Lance. So you're ready to get going? Very excited. Let's do it. Hope you had the nice selection of uh, myths that you prepared for me. Uh, absolutely. We've got some myths that have been, again, commonly perpetuated online and different trainings. And anyway, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll start tackling them. I commonly read online and hear people training that there is a way of tamping too hard. Mm -hmm. This idea that if your shot's running a little bit fast, all you need to do is put a little bit of oomph into it and you'll get a slower shot. So I see oftentimes I'll walk in a cafe and I see baristas boom putting their body weight onto that. So is there a way to tamp too hard? No, there's no way to tamp too hard mm -hmm. because the reason behind this because we have um, the puck and when we extract espresso we do usually nine bars okay. of, uh, of pressure and this nine bars works uh, acts and um, as a force mm -hmm. on the top of the puck, right? Mm -hmm. And this force is around 250 kilograms typically <laughs> on an espresso puck. So it's way more than you can tamp. Not more than I can tamp. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, typically we do yeah. what, 15, 20 kilograms? Yeah, typical maybe 15, 20, 25 is usually in this range. Like when I do studies on espresso, mm -hmm. I usually go for 20 kilos because it's like a nice tamp. So essentially when you're at full compression, you're not, yeah, you're you're not, not getting any more. You're not getting any more. Of course, when you tamp, there's a a bit of movement, right? Because mm -hmm. coffee coffee puck is not like rigid. Yeah. There is movement, but there's not much change if you do more and less. Okay. There's just a bit of flexibility in the of the particles. Okay. They're not super rigid. All right. Well, that was an easy myth debunked. There is a big change whenever you tamp really hard. Because I'm sure a ton of you have anecdotal evidence of a change occurring when you tamp harder. My assumption is that if you tamp really hard and you're up like this, you're likely going to be more uneven in your tamping, which can absolutely change your shot time due to the difference in ch channeling. So the second myth that we hear, this thing that's commonly accepted, is this, it's almost like a mantra that people repeat, which is when you're buying coffee, fresh is best. Oh, I need to get coffee right off the roast. When, when did you roast this? Oh, a week ago? That's too late. I need it three days off roast. It's not always best. Okay. It depends where your preference is. If you like very gassy shots, then perhaps it's the best one for you. But most people will not like a fresh coffee as a best, will not as describe a fresh coffee as a best coffee. Okay. Because fresh coffee contains first a lot of CO2, mm -hmm. carbon dioxide. And uh, uh, when coffee has a lot of carbon dioxide, uh, the blooming is very strong. If you prepare pour over, uh, there's way too much crema mm -hmm. uh, during the special extraction, so you can't extract it properly. That's one issue. And second issue is the composition, the chemical composition of the coffee. When it's really fresh, it has a very high concentration of some very nasty compounds. So one of the compounds in coffee, the aroma compound called, called methanol, mm -hmm. it's the most volatile compound in coffee. Wow. And it has a very unpleasant smell. So typically, methanol, we all know this smell because it's the compound that is added to natural gas to be able for us to smell it. Mm. So it's this type of gassy smell that people describe often the coffee, fresh coffee as gassy. Okay. Uh, I think sometimes they relate to this smell of gas as okay. natural gas or like uh, bottle gas. Um, this smell is in very fresh coffee because of a high concentration of methanol. Interesting. And, and methanol is also very uh, oxygen sensitive. It will last very quickly. So these few d first days after roast, it, de it decreases in coffee um, in its concentration. Mm -hmm. And that's why coffee gets much more palatable, much more balanced okay. because it lo loses the, the methanol. Does it, does it escape at different rates depending on the development or the roast profile? Yes, of course it does. Yes, because uh, it's generated during the roasting mm -hmm. process. So if uh, we have different roast profiles, we have different starting points mm -hmm. of methanol. And then uh, we have with also different rates of degradation based on how porous the coffee is. I guess the TLDR is fresh is not always best. It can be. It can be. It's, it's just relative. Yeah, it's, it's relative. You like if you like it, of course. Uh, certain coffees, perhaps they are uh, quite good fresh because they have low methanol, mm -hmm. but there might be other reasons why they're not so good. Right? Perhaps they're too green still, mm -hmm. and they need uh, time to get rid of the green notes, and yep. these typically take more time than a few days. Like a really lightly roasted yes. coffee yes. might need a few weeks or yeah. even a month. Yes. Okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> Myth number two. 
debunked. Going to the third myth, this one deals with brewed temperature. Oftentimes, I'll read people, hear people, etc., talk about how brewing with boiling water or just with water that's too hot can actually burn the coffee. So getting water off the boil, oh no, that's burning my coffee. Is that true? I would say not. Because burning, it means there's like a really high temperature involved. Mm -hmm. To really create burning flavor, like smoky, ashy notes and uh, flavors like this, you, you need way higher temperature than your brewing, uh, your, your brewing water can be. Okay. So you're looking at uh, 180 to 200 degrees Celsius where you could start burning something. Mm -hmm. But actually with uh, brewing water temperature, you are uh, not burning. So you are maybe hydrolyzing the coffee a bit mm -hmm. you are maybe extracting it a bit faster if you, when you're close so you're extracting these uh, bitter compounds which are not so soluble mm -hmm. with a higher rate so you maybe get a bitter more bitter coffee but you're not burning it so perhaps when people are tasting those bitter compounds that they're attributing to burning it might just be cut be because they are extracting some of those too fast and they are volatile and leave or is it there or are they actually extracting more of those bitter compounds mm -hmm. Good point that you add the volatiles in here because there are two stories of the temperature. One is the temperature is helping you extract compounds. Mm -hmm. So the bitter compounds are not volatile. They are uh, usually quite hard to extract. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, extracting uh, at higher temperature, you'll get more bitterness because you're extracting the bitter compounds better. But the volatility works the other way around. So mm -hmm. if you have high temperature water, you get more evaporation of volatile compounds during the brewing process. So you're losing the high volatiles. So okay. you might be losing some of the delicate notes uh, from the coffee. Okay. Yeah, well, that makes sense. So maybe that's why some of us, you know, realize at 100 degrees, maybe it's not the best for all of our coffees. Maybe it does well for some coffees, but it's not necessarily going to harm your coffee in any weird way. It just may not be optimal. Do you have like a specific range that you like to live in when you brew coffee? I like to brew in this normal range where most people brew, like between 88 to 96, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the coffee. But of course, um, as you also talk, talked in your, some of the previous um, uh, videos, I remember, mm -hmm. uh, don't go too much into this one temperature uh, differences because it's very hard to point out any differences when the temperature is too, too narrow. Because the chemistry, the physics, they don't really change in this half degree, one degree difference. Mm -hmm. We're talking about comparing, you know, 96, 98, close to boiling with like 90 or 85, or mm -hmm. even some uh, brew start brewing with lower temperatures or, or end with lower temperatures. There where we see this massive differences in how compounds behave. Myth number three is absolutely destroyed. So myth number four is that there is this understanding that if you extract a coffee so much, you begin to lose acidity. It, it becomes muted. There's there's uh, there's just less acidity in, a, in an over extracted or a high extracted coffee versus an under extracted. We understand that when we under extract a coffee, for instance, you get kind of sour notes, you get this, um, this really acidic, pungent type of flavor. And then whenever it goes really high, people kind of assume, oh, it's muted, the acidity has gone. So can you talk to this and this idea of extracting high losing acidity? Yes, definitely. So from a chemical point of view, when we are extracting from the coffee, we are extracting material compounds from coffee, right? Mm -hmm. And we have a certain curve. As we go through our brew, we go more and more and more and more and we extract further and further and further until we extract everything. Mm -hmm. So typically when we are at our, you know, 20% extraction yield, which is the typical extraction yield, like most average, your most average brew, right? Mm -hmm. There we are extracting maybe, let's say, 90% of all the acids. Mm, okay. uh, maybe we are at 80% caffeine and like 70% of the bitter compounds. Mm. Uh, but if we go higher than this, if we over-extract the coffee, we will not lose the acids because they are already in the brew, but we still have maybe those 10% left that we can still further extract. Okay. Uh, so the um, over-extracted coffee will still have more as acids in the brew mm -hmm. than, an under, uh, than a, like a normal extracted coffee or an under-extracted coffee. But we have to look at it uh, in a kind of a relative way between um, the concentration of acids and the bitter compounds. Mm. Because when we go to over-extraction, then the bitter compounds start to really increase, right? Because there's more left of yeah, them. Yeah, there's more left of them uh, yeah. between uh, comparing uh, normal extraction and a over-extracted coffee. Mm -hmm. so, so there we start to get this shift between having uh, acids dominating our taste mm -hmm. to bitter compounds dominating our taste. So it's basically only happening on our tongue. Okay. So, so the acids, they do increase, but the burden the compounds increase even more, hence they start to dominate the flavor on our tongue. Okay. So the perception goes towards bitterness, Yeah. but the concentration in our brew 
uh, still increases with acidity. Could it also be that as you are pushing for that final theoretical 10% of acidity, you're also having to use much more water because it's not as extractable then? So you might also be diluting in a way? You are diluting, but uh, we, we should assume that we are at a fixed uh, brew ratio. So if we are at fixed brew ratio, under extracting and over extracting, we are not diluting. Okay, and so how would you define over extraction? It was always kind of my understanding. There's no real such thing as over extraction other than in the eye of the beholder. The only real way you can over extract is if you have maybe a lot of channels that's focusing on specific areas too much, and mm -hmm. so you're getting kind of dryness from those. But as yeah. far as over extracting the whole bed, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so so when I, as I look at it, uh, when you have an under extracted coffee, it's a yield, yield that is lower than you expected. If you have an over extracted coffee, it's a extraction yield that is more than you uh, expected. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about in this uh, channeling, um, I, I, called, I tend to call this over under extracted. Mm -hmm. So you have bits of coffee that, that are over extracted and bits of coffee that are under extracted. Mm -hmm. Hence you start to get both things. You have, yeah. you have sour and bitter at the same time because sure. of this. I guess a side myth that I'm curious about is that you have an understanding and a, a subset of this community that believes higher extraction as long as it's even will always taste better. Is that, is that something you could address? Um, I think this depends on the personal preferences. Sure. Yeah, because if you can tolerate the increased bitterness, mm -hmm. then yes, because okay. you get better body, uh, more uh, in overall intensity. If you don't tolerate the bit increased bitterness, then probably not. Okay. I think it goes to personal preference if it's better or not. But it's an inevitability because yeah. you have roughly 30% more that you're extracting yeah. of, of the bitter yeah. compounds. something like this in the range of 30%. Yeah, that's so like a rough value, yeah. Oh, that makes sense. So you're, you're definitely getting over 20%. You're definitely going to continue increasing in mm -hmm. bitterness. Yeah. But you're also going to increase in some other compounds that might also be nice? Uh, yes, for, for sure. sure. There are some um, perhaps uh, compounds, aroma compounds, which mm -hmm. are not so soluble and they have a good aroma, mm -hmm. and uh, you will start to increase them, yeah? Okay, and in your experience and your understanding of the data that you've been able to procure and analyze, where would you say if someone wanted maybe a really floral or a really fruity type of brew, mm -hmm. when are those acids, uh, at least from your understanding, when are they most dominant? Um, if we go to washed coffees, mm -hmm. as it's traditional, I think they are dominant when they are slightly under extracted. Mm -hmm. But now when we have so many new processes, mm -hmm. uh, new flavors generated that um, they were not present and mm -hmm. like, they're not present in a traditional washed coffee, uh, we still, uh, there are some other effects that are happening. So these compounds are maybe less extractable, behave differently, and you can have compounds which are slowly extractable. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, high extraction yields might be then preferred because of this. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So there we go. That myth. Get out of here. Something that always, you know, gets my goat is I'll post a video and I'm pulling, you know, really lightly roasted coffee and the shot's not pretty. It's not going to be pretty. There's not much, uh, there's not much viscosity. There's not much surface tension in order for uh, any of the channels uh, to be hidden, essentially. There's this understanding that is shared across the majority of home baristas that if you use a naked porta filter, it's the number one tool in order to help you diagnose your putt prep issues. And if you don't see a channel, you don't see squirts, you don't see any bald spots, you don't have channeling. So um, that's a very, that's a kind of a controversial topic, the channeling subject, because there are studies that did some tests mm -hmm. um, to try to prove channeling. There's modeling studies that try to prove channeling, but nobody actually ever saw channeling in real life happening, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of know that it happens from the the fact that you see some sometimes coffee flowing out at really a certain point yeah. from the open um, uh, porta filter or from the top you see holes, uh, but to what degree is happening within the puck or how important it is to overall extraction, uh, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of a very hard measurement. I've been asked this many times. Can you make us a measurement to uh, diagnose channeling with the, like a chemical method? And it's very hard and I've not, not uh, found one yet, yeah. but we're working on it. But, but how I see this problem is the, that we have the puck and we have always uh, some sort of inhomogeneity in the extraction. Mm -hmm. So if we have channeling, if all the water goes through one small channel, then we will have the most inhomogeneous extraction, right? Yeah. Uh, if it goes through uh, a few channels, then we have uh, less inhomogeneous, but it's still not really homogeneous, right? Yeah. Uh, but then when we don't have channels, we don't, uh, it's not necessary that we uh, extract the coffee completely homogeneously. Mm -hmm. Because maybe the, on the, you know, maybe 
we don't have channeling, but we tamped a little bit on the side, and mm -hmm. then on the on the side where it's thinner, the water will flow will be much much uh, faster mm -hmm. um, than on the other side, and you maybe have a very inhomogeneous extraction. Yeah, but it didn't channel. Well, and you could also have just the way that the grounds are distributed in the bed, regardless of how much you might Weiss distribution technique or shake or whatever, you could just have different size kind of particles holding together so densities might be a little different across the puck yeah. which could cause uh, this this in hom homogeneity uh, throughout the puck as well yes it can uh, especially it's cost if you don't do uh, any distribution technique because uh, when you do um, on-demand grinding mm -hmm. uh, the bursts uh, start from zero speed right mm -hmm. so then the first part of coffee that goes out is uh, uh, ground at zero rpm or with lower rpm yep. And then the rest is once the grinder picks up. So the particle size distribution might be different if you like split the coffee dose in two. Uh, first 10 grams might be different than t uh, the last 10 grams. Because so RPM dictates largely the grind size, not as much the distribution? Um, it does. Uh, that's also another another thing that we're not so clear. It's not so clear because it's very different between different coffees, different grinders. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done some studies about this. You also are very much into grinders, and from my understanding, is I don't have a cl clear picture enough to see what the RPM is uh, is doing to the coffee. But it How clearly it does change the grind it size. It does change uh, something. Yes, yeah, in yeah. The coffee. In some coffees, it's not measurable. In some coffees, it is measurable. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does change, and in particular, this when you have on demand that you start the grind from zero and then it speeds up. Uh, very typically, you see that the grind size of the first uh, half of the uh, dose to the second half of the dose is different. Yeah. Yeah, so then, so then something like that where you have uh, stratification of distribution mm -hmm. throughout the basket, you're obviously yeah. going to have non-homogeneity, um, even if you don't see any visible yeah. channels. Even if there's no channels, there is always some inhomogeneity of the extraction. There's no perfect homogeneous extraction because coffee is not a perfectly uh, homogeneous material. Exactly. Yeah, they're not all perfect little spheres. They're all completely rigid and ratchet and weird looking, right? And then you tamp them together and they... You know, they look uniform, but in reality, they're still, it's still wild. Yeah. It's, a, it's a natural material, so you can't expect it to be perfectly homogeneous. Exactly. If you have a shot and it doesn't spray, cool. But guess what? It still wasn't perfectly homogeneous. Okay? Sorry to break it to you. We have the chemist here. Sorry. Okay. Let's move on to myth number six. So, we have probably the most controversial one that we saved for last, and I'm really excited about this. Myth. Nine bar is ideal for the perfect espresso. Is this true or is this false? It uh, could be or could be not. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be controversial. It's an interesting thing in the uh, exp espresso extraction because usually nine bar is used, mm -hmm. but um, if you use less or more uh, pressure, mm -hmm. typically if you use slightly less, you can reach with certain coffees or with most coffees, extractions which are remarkably similar to nine bar extraction. Mm. So the reason behind this is that the coffee puck does not behave according to a linear flow uh, pressure relation. So the Darcy's law does not apply for the coffee puck. Mm -hmm. uh, and this we explain with the fact that coffee puck is slightly compressible. Uh, we talked about with the tamping that even with the hand you can a bit compress it. Yeah. But with the pressure of nine bars, so there's 250 kilograms of force, you compress it quite a bit and then you change the permeability. So you, the particles get closer and closer together. So as you go into some sort of this uh, regime of the um, flow regime of mm -hmm. the espresso extraction, uh, you can get into a situation with certain coffees where between six and nine bars, you get no change in extraction because okay. as you are increasing the pressure, you are compressing the puck, squishing all the particles more together. There's more resistance for the water to flow mm -hmm. and you just get the same effect. Interesting. So it's the same effect even though it's more pressure. Yes, it's more and pressure. More resistance. It's more pressure and it just creates more resistance. It's mm -hmm. not helping the extraction. It's not helping the flow it's rate. It's not harming it either? It's not harming. Pressure is not, har it's not okay. doing anything basically to the okay. coffee. What about the myth, and this is another little side myth, what about the myth, or I guess I say myth, what about the conjecture I've heard that at around 12 bar of pressure you get a secondary compression that can cause a lot of channeling? Yes, because uh, that's true, because mm -hmm. once you go uh, out from this like flat range mm -hmm. um, where the puck is compressed mm -hmm. and uh, linearly with the pressure, then at some point you don't compress it anymore or suddenly, to, uh, or to put it in other words, the permeability of the 
puck decreases so much, so it's so hard to push water through that suddenly the pressure just goes really, really high up. Okay. So when, when, when in your own testing, in your own analysis, where do you see that, like around 12 bar? It's like 7 that, to 11 or something? That's what this report is usually 12, 15 bar in this range. Of course, it okay. all depends on the grind size that you're using, the sure. coffee, the roast level, the brittleness, you know, the share of fines. It's all, it's, there, there's a lot of variables that, that play a role, but let's say in this range. Okay. So you're saying around, you know, overly uh, generalized, around anywhere from like 6 to mm -hmm. 10, 11 bar, you're not seeing that drastic of a difference, mm -hmm. if any. Yes, no. So with certain coffees, there might be differences because mm -hmm. of the puck erosion differences, and then the pressure will start to play a role. Mm -hmm. But with uh, coffees that are very stable in terms of the puck dynamics, it's like a normal coffee. Yeah, then yeah. then uh, you can get a coffee that is nearly indistinguishable, extracted as six bar and nine bar. We had a study once about this, and it was confirmed by the sensory panel. Wow. But it was studied on one coffee, so I cannot you know generalize this of on course. all coffees. But there are situations where where this happens. Yeah. So we've debunked quite a few things in this video. We know that there's no such thing as too hot unless the bitterness is too much for you. It's not burning anything. We've learned that there's no tamping too hard. You tamp away. Just don't sacrifice form for pressure. Don't show off. You don't need to show off. Don't get on your tippy toes. You just need to compress till that table presses back at you. We have learned that there's no really extracting too high. The acidity is going to continue to come out. There's just more bitter acidity to come out later on, which can affect our perception of the goodies. But that's, of course, very much from person to person. So you're not going to extract it, extract it too high. I mean, maybe for you it is, but in reality, a lot of the washed coffees are going to shine mostly with you know, around the 19 or so percent, you say, 20 percent. And if you push it further than that, you might get some interesting acids come out, but you're going to get even more so bitterness. bitterness yeah. yeah. And then we also talked about channeling, and we talked about how there's no shot that's not that's perfectly homogeneous. They all have some unhomogeneity about it. Whatever that word is, inhomogeneity, unhomogeneity, dishomogeneity, I don't remember what it is. One of those prefixes. We also discussed how freshness isn't uh, the deciding factor on a good coffee. It's different from coffee to coffee, on roast to roast. What is that compound that releases? Metentile. Met metentile. And there's varying amounts in each coffee, and that is, you know, like natural gas smell or something yes. like that. And then we also finally talked about pressure and how there's arguably no distinguishable difference between about 6 and 12 bar, depending on the coffee of course. So maybe that could be a static variable whenever we're dialing in an espresso. Not have to worry about pressure. Not have to worry about temperature because we don't see any big differences unless we have a big jump in temperature. And that can maybe help us dial in certain yeah, coffees. Definitely. Yeah. Because this understanding helps you dial in. It helps you understand. If you understand this, mm -hmm. you have to know what is the right way to dial in. Exactly. Start with the coarse, mm -hmm. go towards finer. Because mm -hmm. if you go to too fine, you go into this regime mm -hmm. where you start to get too much comp uh, compression, mm -hmm. Channels forming, compaction, and and you know you don't know where you are. You might be get lost. You suddenly maybe get faster shots. Yeah. So when we're looking at all the variables of extraction, pressures included, times included, temperatures included, but we can kind of push those aside as maybe static things that we don't really need to worry about as much to focus on what does matter, which is well, first off, putt preparation, but very important as we can tell through a lot of these answers but we need to look at start with coarse go finer we need to uh we need to look at the ratio we need to look at uh and grind size right oh there we go awesome well there you have it we crushed those myths and we're curious what you think down in the comments below did any of these shock you do you have any follow-up questions uh, thanks for inviting me here Lance. of course Always a pleasure to talk about uh, science. All right, well, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for watching until now. I hope that you all brew something tasty and cheers.